Okay. We're continuing in our family series today, and today we are speaking to parents. Speaking of the tremendous responsibility of raising up the next generation. Speaking about the responsibilities that come with this charge. But on this day, we're also going to take it one step further in our considerations. As we have mentioned uh, regularly in our messages, what we're focusing on as we talk through these various elements of the Word of God related to the family and really to society as we talk about our evening service and, and what, what we're talking about in the evening, uh, we mention the concept of design. Back in our design message, one of the biggest problems in society today and I mentioned this, is that parents have yielded their responsibility as it relates to their children to various institutions. Now, as we, uh, with, within uh, our various circles, the, the one that comes most often to mind as I say that is the institution of education uh, and, uh, or the responsibility of education being yielded to the institution of the government. While public education, of course, is not in itself evil, as with anything in life, when we yield what might be our responsibility, there is a temptation to, for, for parents to become less and less motivated and involved over time, leading to a situation where parents are either convinced that it is indeed the state's responsibility to teach their children, which has any number of unique and, and uh, problematic results, consequences, or they're simply locked into a system whereby they're nearly forced to let the system do so, the state do so through lack of time, ability, resources, or even by law. But this is not the only area of life where apathy can creep into parenting. The same can be said very often of church. Be this through lack of time, ability, resources, whatever it might be, Parents often feel more comfortable giving their children over to the church to spiritually teach their children than doing it themselves. And churches have, have really embraced this role, especially in the last 50 to 60 years. And because of this, the family has indeed suffered. So today we, we speak of parenting, first practically, then principally. The principle that undergirds the weight of responsibility upon parents to train up their children is one that we find all throughout Scripture. And what I'd like to do today is I'd like to give you four general points that speak toward the parents' responsibilities towards your children. I'm not necessarily speaking uh, toward how those responsibilities ought to, in any given way, bear out in your lives. But I, I, what, what we do need to do is formulate the necessary mindset of understanding that these are the responsibilities of parents as it relates to their children. Let's walk through our four points that we've talked about, uh, that we're going to talk about this morning, beginning, number one, with teaching children the Word of God. Teaching children the Word of God. And as we talk about this, uh, we start where, where any number of messages on parenting uh, would start, and that's with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, where the Bible says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. One Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So in these words we find the first commission given unto parents specifically within the context of a religious perspective. That parents would diligently teach their children the Word of God. Now, there are two interrelated concepts presented here which are essential to understanding if you're going to accomplish this purpose in your children. First, you need to know what you believe. And second, you need to know how to take what you believe and express it to your children. Now, both of these are can be problems for parents in any generation and have, by and large, been, been uh, problems that have cropped up very strongly in the church today. One of the biggest reasons why parents yield their duty to teach their children is because they feel inadequate to do so. They feel as though they are lacking perhaps sufficient uh, skill, sufficient knowledge, or even sufficient opportunity. You know, teaching is hard work. 
And the reason why it's hard work is not just because you have to know things, but because in order to teach, you don't just have to know it, you have to know how to express it to others. In fact, a lot of times people say that they don't even really learn something until they've been forced to teach it, because in order to be able to teach something clearly, you have to know it well enough to be able to articulate it, to be able to explain it to someone else, and that's a whole different level of knowledge. This means that teaching your children is hard work because you have to take the time and the effort to learn this stuff and then you have to have the patience to be able to learn how to express it to others in a way that is understandable to them, particularly to children, in a way that it can relate to them. And of course, taking the time to do this. And this is why the most important element of this command in Deuteronomy 6 is that the word of God would be in your heart. Parents, you cannot pour into your children what you do not have yourself. If you try to establish a do as I say, not as I do type of parenting as it relates to religious things, where you are telling them this is what you ought to do, but you're not exemplifying it, where you're telling them, uh, where, where you're, you're attempting to express things that you don't understand yourself, it's going to, at best, be lifeless. It's not going to have behind it authenticity, and so it's not going to have authority. We need to have the Word of God in our hearts. If the Bible is just something that you do, but yet you don't know, how can you possibly be successful in pouring it into your children? And this can cause parents to be frozen in fear and feelings of incapacity. They want their children perhaps to know the Bible, but they don't know it themselves. And this is a tough place to be in. And so the solution, at least uh, for the past couple of generations, has been, well, take them to church, send them to church, send them to Sunday school, send them to youth group, and let somebody who knows the Bible teach them. This can work. We'll talk about that later. But it can also come with some inadvertent unintended consequences. So this is a tough place to be in. But you know, it, it isn't an excuse. If you have the Spirit of God inside of you, the Bible says that the Word of God is accessible to you through the Spirit of God. It's just going to take some effort. Let me give you some thoughts on this to help parents navigate the fears and the difficulties of teaching your children. And, and may I just say this as we continue? One of the things that I fear, it's just my nature, it's the way I think through things, is that sometimes um, I'm not as positive as I'd like to be. I feel like I'm kind of a, a, a negative preacher at times. I spend a lot of time saying things in terms of right and wrong. Let me encourage you, when we talk about wives, when we talk about husbands, when we talk about parents, talking to children next week, when we're talking about biblical femininity, when we're talking about biblical masculinity, I, I don't want you to walk away from these sermons feeling the weight of responsibility upon you as if it's some sort of burden to bear. The Word of God is called in James the Law of Liberty. Jesus said that He came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God has every intention, not just of giving us what he asks us to do, but equipping us through his spirit to do it. The things that I'm about to tell you, the things that I told you today, the things that I told men last week, husbands last week, uh, uh, wives the week before, men last week and Sunday evening, I'm talking biblical femininity tonight, as, as we talk through these things, the point is not to heap upon you rules and to heap upon you expectations of which you have no burden to bear. In fact, Paul speaks of that in the New Testament, talking about that in relation to the law, that, that the fathers could not bear the weight of these burdens. Jesus said that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that the fathers could not bear the weight of legalistic burdens. That's not the point here. The point is that the Spirit of God has empower, can, will empower you if you're walking in the Spirit and give you every means by which to do that which is necessary to be a good wife, to be a good husband, to be a good parent, to be a, a, a good child, to be what God... If God asks you to do it, then He's there to help you and empower you to do it. 
So let's talk about teaching our children the Word of God. Number one, it is your responsibility, parents, to learn. As I said, you can't tell your kids what you don't know. The Word of God is to dwell in us richly. It calls us to have reasons for, for why we do what we do. If the only reason you do what you do is because of tradition, if the only reason you do what you do is it's just what you know, it's just what your parents did, it's just what your pastor says, it's just what your pastors did, then you yourself are in a difficult place. You, have a, 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 you, you lack the foundation necessary to pass what you believe on in a way that is authoritative. In other words, you're not really reflecting truth, you're just reflecting what you think, not what God thinks. This is one of the things that I tell people when, when you're sharing the gospel, or when you're reflecting to someone some element of doctrine. We don't go up to people and they say, well, I think this, and then you counter with, well, I think this. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think. At the end of the day, it does not matter what I think. When I open the Word of God and I read the Word of God and I expound the Word of God to you and I tell you what I think, maybe that has value to you, maybe it doesn't, and it doesn't have to. Because the part of it where I say this is what I think is just what I think, and that really doesn't matter. The part of it that matters is what does God think? What has God said? What does that mean? What does that mean for me? So we are in a bad place if we don't know the Word of God. And if we don't know the Word of God, then we are not going to be in a position to well-equip our children to know the Word of God. If we don't know the Word of God, then we're not going to be living out the Word of God in our daily lives. So that when our children ask, why do we do what we do? You're not going to be able to articulate a biblical response and thus root your thinking, your actions, your responses, and your decisions in thus saith the Lord. In this is what God has said, or this is how we've taken what God has said and applied it to our lives individually. And that is where the power lies as we teach our children. Not in invoking our own authority, but in resting in God's authority. I was... Uh, a couple years ago, talking with one of my grandparents, and uh, one side of the family are believers, and the other side are unbelievers. And I was talking to the unbelieving side, and my grandfather um, asked me some questions about the Bible. Um, he's never done that before. I've, I've reached out to him on, on several occasions with the gospel. I've uh, tried to broach it. He typically says something to the effect of, well, it's complicated, and everyone has their own path, and those sorts of things. And he comes up to me, and of course he chose two hours before our flight took off. So, uh, um, but uh, he comes up and he says, so if, if God is who he says he is, then why do bad things happen to good people? Very common question. And so I started walking through that question with him and we've talked through that answer on any number of contexts in our uh, assembly. It's not why we're here this morning uh, to answer that question, but I talked through the answer of, to that question with him, uh, a question which I've answered so many times now. Um, it rolls off the tongue very easily. And he said, he said, uh, and, and they're Catholic, he said he's been going to his priest for years, asking various priests that question, and he's never had one priest who could in any way, shape, or form answer that question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And it's a question that none of these priests could ever answer for him. And as I think about that idea, as I think about that idea on the level of a spiritual authority, how many people have been turned away from the Word of God because they go to their spiritual authority and their spiritual authority has not even thought through the answers biblically to questions? Now let's talk about you, parents, as the spiritual authority of your children. You are the first line that your children go to. Now it's not to say you have to have every answer. It's, there's no shame in saying, let's ask pastor. There's no shame in, let's go to the, the bookshelf and, and get a book off the shelf. Let's read that book together. And we'll talk about that more in number three. That, there's no shame in that. But for you simply to just say, I don't know, and move on, is for you to lose an opportunity to win your children. 
for you to lose an opportunity to validate in your children that what you're saying you believe is something that actually is, is real. And so you're risking something as it relates to your children's spiritual future if you aren't willing to take upon yourself the responsibility of learning what you believe and founding your actions and your intentions on something real. We ought to have answers for our children. They don't have to be tremendously theologically deep and adept answers, but have you thought through these questions on your own? Do, do you have something, some confidence that when you wrestle with these things, what do you do? I mean, have you, have you just been effective your whole life when you wrestle with some question, uh, uh, some inconsistency as it relates to how you perceive the world and the Word of God? Do you just bury it and move on? Can you just... Do you, do you have confidence that your children are going to be able to do the same? That when they come up to you and you, they ask that question and you say, well, you know, I've thought about it, but I've just never... I, it just doesn't matter. Just, just trust Jesus, Johnny. Just trust Jesus. Do you really have enough confidence to say that that's going to be enough for your child just because it was enough for you? We need to have the Word of God in our heart. We need to be expressing it and living it out, teaching it to our children. Number two, if you get lazy, your children will suffer. Before my wife and I had children, we could get away with staying up late talking. We could have a late night snack, go out at midnight, sit on the hood of the car and watch the stars. But then something strange happened when we had kids. The desire to spend time with my wife and for us to do all of those things that we would enjoy doing was still there. And every once in a while we would do that, but then we found something to be true, that when I put my kids to bed at 8, if I stay up till midnight, if I stay up till 2, my children are going to wake up at 7 or 6, well, the time we've trained them to get up, regardless of whether or not I stay up late or not. My children aren't going to bed late also, which means if I put them to bed at normal time, they're waking up at normal time, whether or not I, I'm, I, I stay up late. I can't just sleep through my children's early morning. They get up, they're hungry, they want breakfast. I can't just say, well, I'm not going to feed you today because I'm tired, children. It doesn't work that way, right? My responsibilities begin when my children wake up, regardless of the time I go to bed. Parents, the same can be said spiritually. If you get lazy, so that you don't want to take the time and the effort to pour into your kids the Word of God. Because it is hard. Because it's tiring. Because it means repeating yourself a lot. Because it means having to slow down. Because it means that things are busy and life is, life is moving and you have to take a moment when life is moving to stop and to reorient a child's perspective as it relates to the Word of God. To stop and discipline your child even though you've got somewhere to be, or you're really tired, or whatever the case may be. And so if you get lazy, and you say, well, isn't there just some easy way? Can't I just put them in a program that'll make them godly? And you justify skipping the spiritual nourishment of the week, or of the month, or of the year. You just need to know that in the same way that if you are skipping out on responsibilities with your children physically, if you're just tired and lazy, so you, tell your, so, so you only enforce your children brushing their teeth one day of the week, you're instilling in them a lack of habit that is going to make it harder to break later on. If you don't have consistency with your children early, it's going to be harder for them later. You know that, right? We all know that. That the way we train up our children makes it easier or harder for them as they get older. I was sitting in on a school board meeting a while ago. I, I was pretty active in the public schools when I, I was, before my schedule got a little busier, I was pretty active in various uh, uh, elements of, of the system here in, in uh, Buffalo, Hanover, Montrose. And uh, we were in a, a brainstorming session for what the school needed to do. And one of the teachers brought up, we need to have more classes on how to make your bed, how to wear, you know, that you need to wear deodorant, how to brush your teeth. And it became apparent that, that, ch that children aren't learning even the basics of how to live a life from their parents anymore. 
Now carry that over into the spiritual. It's not easy to have to have the structure and the discipline to teach our children good habits. Wake up in the morning, make your bed, get dressed, brush your hair, brush your teeth. But it's worth it for their sakes. What about the spiritual? What about the spiritual? Are you, have, you, have you thought toward that area? Or are you just, maybe you've got it all under control physically, but you have completely abandoned the spiritual responsibility? Spiritual training is not something that you can just phone in. It takes work, it takes effort, it means routine, it means consistency, it means responsibility, and if you don't do it, your children will suffer the consequences of that. Doesn't mean that they're all going to go into perdition. By God's grace, he's bigger than you. But you are responsible for your children, not just physically, but spiritually. See it that way. Third thought. It's okay to learn at the same time as your children. Say, Pastor, I agree with you, but I'm in trouble. I don't know enough about the Word of God to teach my children. Well, that's okay. That's okay. But here's the thing. You can come every week. You can come to Legacy Baptist Church. You can sit down with your children. You can learn with your children. And if you come Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Tuesday night, you have four hours of biblical teaching that you can then learn with your children and reinforce throughout the week. That's the structure of our church. Uh, so Sunday school has been a little different over the past year, but the structure of our church is our, the, what we encourage you to do is this. You take the Word of God as it's taught during, the, uh, d during these sessions. You're learning the same thing your children are learning. You pick from it those things that are necessary. Whether you've learned them or not, you either know them, reinforce them, or you're learning them. And then your family goes home and you live them that week. And you work on them that week. Well, pastor, I don't know the Word of God very well. Okay, but, but you, you're going to learn something come to church, we're going to open the Bible, something's going to be said, take that, discover its truths with your children, and then say during the week, family, this is what we learned this week, let's practice it together. If we learn about pride on Sunday, let's make the theme of this week identifying and rooting out pride. And so we're all going to spend time identifying the areas of our lives where we have pride and working on it. If we learned about loving our neighbor on Tuesday night. Then we're going to go out and we are going to love our neighbor this week. We're going we're to take time on Wednesday thinking about what we can do for those in our area. We're going to bake cookies for them or we're going to uh, uh, go clear out their yard from, for, with, with the yard debris or uh, various times of the year. We're going to shovel for them. We're going to mow the lawn for them. And then we're going to go up to them and give them a gospel tract and say, we're glad that you're our neighbor. We're, we're learning the Word of God together. We're growing together. Children don't mind seeing their parents learning and growing. We have this idea, perhaps, in our minds, and, and I feel like this just from my own experience. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just a weirdo. Say, oh, yeah, Pastor, we know that. But maybe, just in, maybe in this area I'm a weirdo. Uh, I often... You know, as a child, you perceive adults as ready-made, right? As a child, you perceive adults and you think they've got it all under control and they've got it all figured out. And then you become an adult and you still don't feel like an adult. You just, you feel like you always did. And, and you're, you're certainly not all together and you don't have it all together. I, I often think about this even as with my parents. And, and I, I, when I think about my parents and the way they ran the home, I'm thinking about my teenage years. And now I've got kids of young age and, and I think about how our home is running right now and I feel like it's just uh, absolute, you know, controlled chaos. And I think, well, I don't remember controlled chaos ever being the theme of my home, but wait a minute. When I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking of when I was 16 and my sister was 18 and my, you know, my other one was 10. I'm not thinking of when we were all young children because I wasn't thinking about it then. 
we think about government officials and we have this tendency to think about people in government, politicians, when particularly when we're young and idealistic as if they're actually people that know things and then you start getting into politics, you study and you realize that they don't know anything, just like anyone else, right? We're, we're all figuring it out. Now let's talk about your spiritual life. You don't have to be ready-made, parent. You don't have to pretend as though you have all the answers to your children. As a matter of fact, there's something refreshing about a parent that has to go up to their child and say, you know what, I made a mistake, please forgive me. There's something refreshing about a parent who can go up to their child and say, I don't know the answer to this, let's learn it together. There's something refreshing because, see, we are that, so why do we have to pretend like we're something we're not to our We don't have to do that. Our children are going to see through it anyway. They're, any hypocrisy we have, they're going to see. So let's just choose not to be hypocritical. Grow with your children and they will love you for it. They will respect you for it because they will know it's real to you. They will know it matters to you because you're trying. Just like they are. Four, if they learn apart from you, there will be no essential reinforcement. Now, it's not a problem to have children learn apart from you, especially as they get older. They're going to read books. So you don't have time. You know, I like to read every book that, that, that before I read it to my children and all that. There comes a point where that's not necessarily going to be possible anymore. I've got children going this way. I've got children going that way. I'm encouraging them to read. And there's too many books to read, not enough time in the day. It's great to have your children learn new things. But let's talk about just the spiritual aspect, the primary elements of learning. If, you're ch if you don't know what your children are learning, then, then you have a, a unique disadvantage in that you don't know how to reinforce it. You don't know how to hold them accountable. If we want to get good at anything in this life, it takes this little thing called practice, right? A team can't just show up for games and expect to win unless they have practiced considerably. A student can't just show up for tests without first having learned and then reinforce through repetitive practice the concepts that he is learning. That's what gives us success. We practice things. Your children will not know the Bible just by reading it once. And your children will not be good at following the Lord Jesus Christ just because they've heard something from the pulpit. It needs to be reinforced. We need to reinforce virtues in our lives. And this is where it comes down to you knowing what your children are learning. If you don't know what your children are learning, if you are not taking ownership over your children's education, and I'm not even talking about the method. We, we, we try to make it easy here because you, you're not separated from your children. That's why we do that. It makes it easy. You know what your children are learning because you're learning it too. But even if we did send children off to Sunday schools and youth groups, uh, if you, you know, have your kids in public school and you send them off to public school, that doesn't take away your responsibility to know what they're learning. And not just so that you can correct any errors, which is often necessary, but also so that you can reinforce what is true. I remember growing up and the parent asking, What'd you learn today? Whether it's getting home from school, because I was public schooled, or whether it was um, you know, coming out of Sunday school. What'd you learn today? Nothing. Right? Nothing. That was, just a, that was the standard response. What'd you learn today? Nothing. Well, I probably did learn something, but I'm not, I, I don't really want to take the time to, to tell you, or whatever the case may be. What'd you learn today? Nothing. Or maybe I can't, literally can't think of anything that I learned that day, which in school was so, quite a few days. Well, you got to dig deeper than that, parent. No, tell me what you learned. Let's sit down. Let's actually talk about it. Let, dig a little bit. Ask some questions. Well, what passage of Scripture were you in? What, 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 what was math? What did you learn in math today? Let's narrow the field, right? for those in, uh, that have their kids in public school. Narrow the field. What'd you learn in this subject today? What subjects did you have today? Now, for many of our parents, because of the structure of our church and then your homeschooling, you've already taken ownership of that. Now the question is, are you actually doing what that ownership enables you to do? 
So you come to a non-age segregated church, which means you're learning what your children are learning. Maybe they're picking up on some of it, maybe they aren't, because I don't preach to the low, I preach to the high. We do a trickle-down system here. I preach to the parents, and the parents trickle it down to their children. You know what your children need. This message might not be as applicable to them yet, unless they're older children. But the idea is this. You take what you hear in the, word of, uh, the message, and as you're driving home, you and your wife are talking about what elements of what Pastor Wickler said are necessary for your children to know, and how it is on Monday morning when you have Bible time together, you're going to express those concepts in a way that they can understand, and then how you two can reinforce them throughout the week. So that it's not just stuff they know, but it's stuff that they begin to put into practice. Right? If they learn apart from you, there will be no essential reinforcement. So learn what they're learning so that even if it's, I mean, God, God willing, it's good stuff, good. You want them to learn good stuff, but you've got to help them reinforce it. Help them learn how to create in their lives these good habits, how to create in their lives this virtue. Take ownership of your children's spiritual journey. Help them through this time in their life. Do it with them. Every element of life can be connected to God's word. When we read the news, you can connect it to God's word. When their friends are unkind to them, you can connect that to God's word. When they have chores to do, you can connect this to God's word. Can't you? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If they're in there scrubbing the toilet and they're grumbling, there is a spiritual lesson to be learned then. So don't be lazy. I know you've got a thousand things to do, but take the five minutes to stop your child who's scrubbing the toilet, sit them down, look them in the eye. Let's talk about how we ought to do this in the Lord. Let's talk about how there's spiritual reward and blessing for those that submit to their parents in joy, submit to their authorities in joy, and let's talk about how you lose your reward if you're not. You want those rewards. So I can scrub the toilet with joy, knowing that through that submission, God is pleased. Can you please the Lord, child? And then go on with your day. Teach him something. It's everywhere if the Word of God is dwelling in you richly. Every element of life can be connected. God's Word is intended to touch every moment of our lives. Number five, pour into your children everything you can, even if you feel inadequate. If you're working hard, not being lazy, teaching what you know, here's the thing, you can trust God to do the rest. Just be faithful. Pour into your children what you do know. You know the Gospel. If you've been saved, Say, well, pastor, I don't really know it very well. Look, if you've been saved, then you know that you know the gospel well enough to be saved, which means you know, give me your testimony. Just give me your testimony. Talk of your testimony. Talk of how you know you're in Christ. Talk about what the, what the Bible says about being saved. You can do that. Let the gospel bubble up in your conversations. You know that God is creator. Remind your children of this. Remind your children that he is the authority. In, 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 in your lives. When you go fishing, speak of God's creation. When you go camping, speak of God's creation. When it snows, speak of God and it rains. You can go to Isaiah 5 and talk about God's word that, that speaks of his word not returning void. When the flowers bloom, when the grass grows, the Bible talks about flowers and grass. Talks about it somewhat negatively. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth. But the word of God will endure forever. Spring's coming. Flowers are going to pop up. There's a lesson there. Are you teaching it? All of these things speak to the glory of God, so keep God on the front of your children's minds, which again, goes back to point number one, it means it has to be on the top of your mind. Teaching our children is about God, not about us. It's not necessarily something deep or complicated. But it does take effort, it takes discipline, it takes faithfulness, it takes intention. May I use that word? And it takes humility to admit what you know and what you know you don't know. And to grow with your children, as the case may be. So the responsibility to teach the children the word of God, parents, it's laid by God himself upon us. 
You can get help. We all need help. You can use resources. We all need resources, and these are helpful things. But you need to see, this is a mindset. You need to see the responsibility as your own. Whatever elements of it you delegate to others is fine, but the buck stops with you, right? Just as a husband can delegate the home to his wife in any number of ways, but at the end of the day, husband, the buck stops with you. Parents, you can delegate the, the teaching responsibility. If your children find a mentor, praise God for that. If they're reading godly books, praise God for that. If you want to sit them down during Bible time to some godly preaching, praise God for that. But just know that at the end of the day, God's holding you accountable, not your, your pastor not their mentor, not that podcast. You. It's your responsibility. Next point. Mold children through discipline. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says this, And fathers, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That word nurture there means chastening or training. The word admonition means rebuke or warning. Chastening and rebuke. It is the responsibility of parents to guide their children into positive and appropriate behavior, into an understanding of authority, and into the concepts of both spiritual and physical discipline through chastening and love. The Proverbs are, are, are filled with admonitions in this regard. And first, we, we talk toward why chastening is so important to begin with. Proverbs 17, 25 says, A foolish son is a grief to his father, and bitterness to her that bear him. Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now every parent loves their children. And every parent, to a large degree, is predisposed to believe that their children are good kids. This is just natural. But it's not what the Bible says. We're all sinners, and anyone left to himself will default to the baser elements of his nature. A foolish child is a tremendous grief to his parents. Those of you who have a child who has wandered, or have seen a parent with a child who has wandered from the faith, or those of you who were a wandering child yourself, you understand this. Children left to themselves will bring shame to their parents, possibly to society. Children properly disciplined are, are not having conformity or subjection crammed into them if you're doing it right. What you're instilling in them is wisdom and discipline. And in these verses, we begin, of course, to see the solution as well. The Bible speaks of the rod of correction that drives foolishness from the heart of a child. Physical discipline. These are not the only Bible verses that commend us to this form. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Don't allow his crying to make you stop chastening him. Proverbs 20, verse 30, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. That's an interesting one. Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 15, as we, we read, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13 through 15, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and he shall, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now, we're all living in a society that would call these verses child abuse and would consider me the most evil person in the world for commending this element of the Word of God to you. And in many churches, may I say, that, may, may I say this candidly, in many churches, among many parents, the way they understand physical discipline, it is absolutely child abuse. It is. Many Christian parents are not disciplining their children. They are abusing their children Many Christian churches that teach the rod aren't teaching the difference between child discipline and child abuse. But you need to know the difference. Because biblical discipline will instill into your children wisdom and bring them to joy. Child abuse will drive your, ch your child from you. Biblical discipline aligns with God's will and brings reward both upon you and upon your children. Child abuse will bring God's judgment upon your head 
when you stand before him. So let's talk about the difference. As we consider back in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, this idea of fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, we see here. Provoke not your children to wrath. Discipline and anger are on two entirely different spectrums. Now often when a child is not listening or he disobeys and defies you as their authority, this makes you upset, angry. Especially if you've just told them what to do, they looked at you and said, uh-huh, and then go and do the opposite. But to strike your child in anger is not an outworking of love for them or a desire to inst instill in them wisdom. To strike your child in anger is not chastening. This is you venting your frustration upon your child. This is abuse. This has no place in the home, has no place in a Christian home. Anger is not always sinful, according to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. But that's outside the scope of our time today. But to attack someone against whom I am angry and physically take my anger out upon them, especially when we talk about children who are uh, under our care, who are weaker, who are defenseless, who are vulnerable, and who are relying upon me to protect them, this is wrong. This is not discipline. This is not chastening. This is child abuse. It has no place in the Christian home. If you're angry at your child, don't discipline them at that moment. Back off. Calm down. Delegate it to your spouse. Don't discipline them at that moment. Wait until you're calm, then discipline them. And, and much of this problem is taken care of if you understand two important elements of discipline. The first element is that discipline is intended to be objective and consistent. Many parents go wrong in that they don't actually physically discipline their children. The physical discipline of their children is like the last resort. And it only comes when they boil over. So that on one day, when a parent says, uh, when a child does something, a parent might just give them a, the ugly look. And the next day, when the child does the exact same thing, a parent might spank their child. And the only difference is how their parent is feeling on that day. If you're having a good day, then you're more patient. If you're having a bad day, then you boil over and you spank the child. That is not proper discipline. That is not proper discipline. When we act this way, several things happen. Number one, most likely we're disciplining in anger, which is a problem. Number two, we are now, when our child is, is receiving that discipline, do you know they're not connecting that discipline to their action? They're connecting that discipline to your emotion. It can build resentment in them because now they have a reason to blame mom or dad. Well, if dad wasn't so angry, then I wouldn't have gotten a spanking. So that when you look at your child and say, why did you get a spanking? They say, well, because you were angry today. And, you know, it was. Because yesterday, you didn't give them a spanking for that same thing. Tomorrow, you may not either. So they connect in their heart and mind, mom and dad's, the, the, the discipline they have just received to your emotions. And then this creates an inconsistency which can carry over to any no uh, other areas of life. So now I only go the speed limit when I feel like there might be a police officer around because I'm connecting obedience to, a th to, to the disposition of my authority. If I, if I drive through a town and I know that the police there don't really care, then what do I care about going the speed limit? Because they're not going to enforce it anyway. See, because as I grew up, as long as I could discern that my parents were in a good enough mood or that they weren't going to enforce it anyway, then I could break the rules and it would be fine. I'd just get, a, I'd just get an, a, 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 an, an askewed glance. But if they were in a bad mood, then I'd have to be walking on eggshells because I'd know anything would set them off and I'd get a spanking. And now they are not actually learning to do what's right. They're learning to game the system. Now they're not actually being taught that choices have consequences. They're being taught that choices under certain con within certain contexts have consequences. But it has nothing to do with the choice you're making. It has to do with the disposition of the authority that's giving you the consequences. 
But if, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, rules are rules. Consequences are consequences. Choices are choices. So that everything has been great and you're in a great mood and your child lies to you and you've got to deal with it. And on another day, it's a bad day and you're in a bad mood and your child lies, uh, lies to you and you deal with it the same way. Then your child begins, he has to, she has to, begin connecting the discipline to their action, not to your emotional state. To their choice, not to you. So that when they stand before you and, and the discipline is finished, they have no one to blame but themselves. Now, the human heart has any capacity to blame others anyway. But as they are honest with themselves, they'll learn that they have no one to blame but themselves. And if they don't want the discipline, they don't commit the action, the grievance. And now, let's talk about how our children respond to their government authorities. Now, let's talk about how they respond to their boss. Now, let's talk about how they respond to God and God's word. And it's not, well, I'm going to sin and then look for lightning bolts from heaven. And if the lightning bolts don't come, then I'm going to assume that today's an okay day, that God's not in a bad mood so I can get away with it. And while no Christian would say that, how often do we act that way? If your children are connecting discipline to your mood, they are not learning the lessons that you want them to learn. They're learning that their actions have consequences when they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. But if you're faithful, if you're consistent, if you're objective in discipline, then they are going to connect their actions to discipline. And wisdom will dictate to them that they change their actions so that they don't get discipline. And you're instilling wisdom in them and you're driving foolishness far from them and your discipline is successful. Discipline in objective consistency. Number two, discipline unto a repentant heart. Chastening is a means unto an end. And that end is not for the child to feel bad. That end is not for the child to, to be hurt. That end is to have wisdom instilled in them and to bring them to repentance. That they find a heart of repentance, that they change their heart toward you. This is the object of chastening. And chastening doesn't need to go on beyond that objective. Once the objective is reached, chastening is no longer necessary. Now, when we talk about this, we can talk about the difference between chastening a child unto repentance and giving them a punishment or a consequence for their actions, but these can be two different things. The repentant child does not need chastening. He may still have a consequence for his actions, but he does not need chastening. If your child comes to you with a heart of repentance and, and willingly voluntarily confesses something they did wrong to you. They did something wrong. They shouldn't have done it. And instead of just rolling the dice to see whether or not mom and dad are going to find out, they come up and say, mom and dad, I did this. I shouldn't have done this. Please forgive me. Now, there might still need to be some sort of consequence. Mom and dad, I used the tea set and you told us not to use it. Please forgive me. Okay. You can't use the tea set today or tomorrow or next time you know, there's a, an occasion you don't get to use the tea set. Natural consequence of you going outside the bounds of what was expected of you. But if I find out the tea set was used and I say, who did it? And my children say, uh, 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 well, now I have to go through the process of chastening them to a repentant heart. I have to go through the process of bringing about in them the willingness to confess and acknowledge their sin. I don't have to do that if they have already acknowledged their sin to me. Their heart is already aligned with me. Maybe there needs to be a consequence. Maybe there doesn't need to be a consequence. But there certainly does not need to be the part of, uh, of discipline called chastening to align their heart with you. See, God does this, doesn't he? 1 Corinthians 11, verses 31 and 32, the Bible says this. Speaking, this is after the Lord's table and and. and Paul talking about how they were doing it wrong. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So the Bible says that when we judge ourselves, God doesn't need to judge us. If I, after having sinned, 
I'll willingly, purposefully uh, realign my heart with the Father, then God does not have to go out of his way to call me to align my heart with him. Because I've already done it. So I don't need to be judged, chastened of the Lord. Now when I'm walking contrary to him, and I've not aligned my will with the Father, then he has to chasten me. Because I'm walking contrary to him. Until I align my heart with him. And then this chastening can stop. Now, I judge myself so that I need not be judged. Does that mean there's no consequences? I judge myself. I cheated. I lied. I stole. I get it right. I judge myself. I confess it before the Lord. I realign with him. I confess my sin. Does that mean there's no consequences? Well, no. Because I'm going to have to acknowledge my fault and that may come with some physical consequences. God's not necessarily going to to preserve me every time from the natural consequences of cheating or of lying. But God doesn't have to chasten me because I've realigned my heart with him. We know that God chastens his children and we know that it's in love. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Quoting from Proverbs 3. For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards illegitimate children and not sons. Chastening is the mark of a loving father. Parents, if you don't chasten your children to, to cause, to bring about in them an alignment of their heart with yours, if you, if you are in this, if you have fallen for the lie of permissive parenting, if you have fallen for the lie that to discipline your children is to do wrong by your children, if you are fallen for the lie that you should not even be seen by them as an authority, only as a friend, then you're missing out on the most important aspects of what it means to love them. Now, if you're a good authority, if you're a good parent, you and your children will be friends in due season. You will. But if you fail to be a good authority in order to be a good friend, you'll find your children, as the word of God says, will become a grief unto you. Number three. So first, teach your, teach your children the word of God. Second, mold your children through discipline. Third, care for your children in love. Parents, whether you want it or not, much of how your children will understand God will come down to you. Particularly, may I say, fathers. Much of how your children will understand and relate to God will come down to you. I cannot tell you how often I spend time in counseling with men and with women who are struggling with their relationship with God and it comes down to their relationship with their father. That might sound psychobabbly. That might you know, sound whatever. But it comes down to the fact that they are imposing the way they understand their relationship with God the Father they are imposing their relationship with their human father onto their perception of their relationship with God and it's messing them all up because they had a bad dad. This happens all the time. All throughout the Bible, God relates himself to us through the idea of being a father and he does that because the father is supposed to be this unique, loving, careful relationship and so God relates to us in that way. That's why the family is so important. That's why the attack on the family is so devastating to our society. Because one of the, the, the ways that society has always learned, every society has learned of who God is, is by seeing their father and their mother and how they interact and how their father disciplines them and how their mother cares for them. Parents, whether you want it or not, your children will relate to God to some degree until they can mature past it, until they can get past that, which we all have to do. Your children, especially young children, will relate themselves to God in the same manner that they relate themselves particularly to fathers. And it is one of the most telling statistics of our time that in this time when young people are leaving the church by, I mean, just en masse, in this time of tremendous elevation of suicide and depression 
and spiritual listlessness among young people and confusion, our society has an epidemic of fatherless homes. These are directly related. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes, five times the average. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes, 32 times the average. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders, whatever we want to call that today, are from fatherless homes, 20 times the average. 80% of rape rapists, particularly those dealing with anger problems, which most rapists are, come from fatherless homes, 14 times the average. 71% of high school dropouts from fatherless homes, nine times the average. 70% of youths in state-operated institutions are from fatherless homes, nine times the average. 85% of youths in prison come from fatherless homes, 20 times the average. And this is only the beginning. This is only the obvious. This doesn't even account for the many troubled people who live in homes where their fathers are present but inactive, which are effectively fatherless homes where they fail to perceive his love. Now, as I say this, we draw this link. Children perceive God as they perceive their father. A distant father perceives a distant God. An unforgiving and angry father, an unforgiving and angry God. A cold father, a cold God. I, I don't desire to minimize the mother's role the mother teaches the next generation of the relationship between Christ and his church. The mother is naturally more uh, careful, more loving, more, more sympathetic, more empathetic. And, and these are all positive attributes. But what is interesting about this is that it is actually for this reason that so many people are attempting to feminize God today and the church has become so effeminized. Because what has happened is there are so many poor father figures that when people finally realize that, you know, like... God loves them, the thing that the Bible says, they have no means by which to connect that to any human fatherly figure, and so they connect God significantly more to their mother than they do to their father. And then they think of mom's love, and so they remove from their mind God's hand of discipline and God's hand of provision and protection and his holiness and his righteousness because God is now more like mom than dad, and the church goes down this sinkhole of confusion and femininity, which, and then, and then it just implodes because it's, it's entirely outside of God's design. Parents, fathers in particular, you are your children's example of God, of who he is. And again, I'm not trying to lay the weight of the world upon your shoulders. You have God's Holy Spirit. God can work in spite of your, your failings. We're not talking about, about you having to be a perfect man. When the Bible says, however, that God is a loving father who disciplines his children, can your children relate to that through you? How are they going to relate God's discipline through you. Are they going to assume when they read that God is, as a loving father disciplines his children, are they then going to think that God the Father is some moody father who disciplines in anger when he, when he, when he, when he boils over and then ignores it when he's, when, when, when he's otherwise less interested? Or are they going to think, are they going to connect a father disciplining his children in love to consistency? Are they going to connect a father disciplining his children in love to objectivity, to a, a chastening in order to reach the heart of the child, not just the actions of a child? Now, God can work through whatever misconceptions your failures uh, have, have, have brought about. None of us is perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to have areas of our character that are lacking. God can work through all of that. But you can save your children a great deal of grief and trouble if God doesn't have to help them relearn the things that they should naturally learn through you. One final thought this morning. If you don't do these things, someone else will. Now, in one sense, this might be what some parents want, right? This may be the object, the idea. Yeah, right. I can't do these things, so I send my kids to someone else to do them. 
All of these tasks are daunting, difficult, frustrating. It means tremendous sacrifice. It means nights in prayer. It means care to avoid hypocrisy. It means humility, knowing when to apologize to your children, to admit your own faults and your own incapacities, the constant need to walk in God's spirit, to know how to deal with these children who have such differing personalities and who need such individual care and love and attention and devotion. It's much easier just to bring them to church and trust pastor to do these things for you. And if all goes well, if your children get good examples, if they have a stable home and they're willing to listen and learn and, and, and to have enough self-discipline self and initiative to implement these things into their own lives when they hear them, things can work out just fine. But it doesn't always work this way, does it? Sometimes children, because they can't rely on their parents to, to take the time or to even seek out answers, they'll stop turning to their parents and then they'll turn to their peers. And they'll go to their friends for suggestions and their friends for help instead of to their parents. Because they feel as though if they go to their parents and say, I'm struggling with a sin, their parents are just going to wallop them instead of help them. Their parents are just going to be angry and say, you've been doing what? Go to your room instead of saying, let's sit down and let's learn how to help you through this. So they don't go to their parents because they're afraid to go to their parents. They don't trust their parents. And so they go to their peers. Or if they're blessed by God, they, they have a mentor who invests in them. Children get it's one teacher whom they respect more than mom and dad. It's walking contrary to scripture and they follow him down his path. Children fail to be disciplined early in life, and so they have to be disciplined by society later in life. So they get fired from their jobs. So they have to learn the hard way about relationships because they were not instilled wisdom in their younger years. Again, I'm not trying to cause fear and dread to well up in your heart's parents. I'm not trying to emotionally manipulate you into some sort of action. But you need to understand that you're not the only person contending for the hearts of your children. And today, in this media generation where YouTube and radio and television and everything is just so prevalent, and it's all in our pockets, much less in our homes, there's going to be a great number of people in society vying for the ideological zeal of your children. But they're yours. Take ownership over them. It was William Wallace in 1865 who wrote a poem entitled, What Rules the World? It's a short poem. It goes like this. They say that man is mighty. He governs land and seas. He wields a mighty scepter or lesser powers than he. But mightier power and stronger man from his throne has hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. So the scriptures tell us this, Psalm 127. Song of degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. When the Lord builds your house, parents, when you do it his way, when you model your parenting, fathers, mothers, when you model your parenting after God's hand of love toward you, his discipline, his methods, his exhortations, when your children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, when you do it God's way, may not always make sense. Proverbs said, sometimes your children are going to cry. Don't stop. Sometimes they're going to call you things that they're going to regret. They're going to say that you're a bad person, that you're a bad parent. Don't stop. Be the parent God would have you to be. When you're taking the responsibility upon yourselves to ensure that your children know sound doctrine, when you teach them how this doctrine touches their lives, 
then your quiver is full of arrows, happy are ye. You will not be ashamed. They'll speak with the enemies at the gate. You'll have done as much for this world by raising strong, stable, godly, capable young people as anyone could. Indeed, parents, this is the legacy that matters. How much money you have, how capable you are at your craft, how intelligent, whatever it is, is those things come and go. If you find yourself in a history book, you'll only be there until someone rewrites it. Many spiritual things will go with you to your grave. There's many legacies that you'll take with you to heaven. There's many rewards that all of you as parents will take with you. But the thing that stays behind, you know, they say you can't take anything with you and it doesn't matter what you leave behind. Well, there's one thing that you leave behind that has spiritual import. Much treasure is laid up in heaven through your faith and through your obedience and through your labor. But one material thing that every parent leaves to this earth when they die, one legacy that will linger past their days is, is, is your children. Give your time and your effort. Give your life to this legacy. We lay the foundation, parents, of the next generation, maybe of civilization, maybe of society. On the path that they're going, maybe not. But at least this you know for sure. Sitting in these seats, these young people are the next generation of the church. That's what we're building. We are called to shape the hearts of the leaders of tomorrow. Don't give that up. Don't give that up to the government. Don't give that up to the church. Partner with them. But you keep ownership. Don't yield it on the altar of convenience. Don't lose it because you're tired. Don't fail at this great privilege because you're apath apathetic. Obey the word of, God, uh, word of the Lord. Fight for the souls of your children. Teach them, train them, mold them to be mighty warriors for the Lord. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.